Hi, and welcome to online worship here at the Laverne Church of the Brethren. My name is Amanda Bennett, and I'm one of the pastors here at this inclusive, affirming, justice-seeking church. We are so glad that you chose to worship with us today online. Today, you'll hear Pastor Tom as he preaches a sermon entitled, Three Cheers for the Church. It's sure to be a great message. There's so much going on in the life of this church community, but here are a few announcements for you today. On Sunday, January 29th, we'll be holding an all church council meeting and luncheon. This is a time for members and friends to gather and do the business of the church. The major agenda items for this particular church council meeting will be the 2023 budget. We'll also hear an update from the pastoral search committee and prior to the council meeting, the youth of our congregation will be offering a special potato bar luncheon as a way of raising funds for a civil rights tour that's scheduled for late June. This trip is, going, is open to all ages and will include visits to really important historical sites in Montgomery, Selma, and Atlanta and we'll be reflecting on social gains and continued needs in the ongoing struggle for racial justice. If you'd like to support the youth as they raise funds for this trip, you can do so by sending a check and noting civil rights tour in the memo line or by donating electronically, uh, selecting the civil rights tour on PayPal or noting the phrase civil rights tour on your Zelle donation. Your support will be greatly appreciated and it will help educate many on the intersection of faith and racial justice. Lenten Connect groups are now forming. We're looking for people who want to facilitate groups during Lent surrounding topics of their interest. In the past, topics have included birding, art, book studies, and more. So if you'd like to lead a group based on an area of your interest, please visit our website and find the Lenten Connect signups page under the Connect menu option. Fill out the form and someone from the staff will contact you about setting up the group that you'd like to lead. And now, may we continue in a spirit of worship this day. Our second scripture comes from Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 through 11. I thank my God for every remembrance of you, always in every one of my prayers for all of you, praying with joy for your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work in you will continue it 
will continue to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to think this way about all of you, because I hold you in my heart, for all of you are my partners in God's grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I long for all of you with the tender affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may overflow more and more with knowledge and full insight to help you to determine what really matters, so that in the day of Christ, you may be pure and blameless, having produced the harvest of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ for the glory and praise of God. Cheers for that anthem, huh? Three cheers for the choir. That was beautiful. Story about a young boy who came in late to Sunday school, and he was usually prompt, so the teacher asked him if something was wrong, and the boy told her that he was planning to go fishing with his dad, but at the last minute, his dad told him that he needed to go to church instead. Well, I'm glad you came, said the teacher. Did your dad explain to you why it's more important for you to go to church than to go fishing? Yes, the boy replied. Dad said he didn't have enough worms for the both of us. <laughs> or the one about the boy who came home from church one Sunday with a chocolate ice cream cone. Where did you get that, asked his father. With the money that you gave me this morning, replied the boy. But that money was for the church, said the father. I know, the boy replied, but the usher I met at the door got me in for free. <laughs> the, book in the, uh, the book of Philippians in the New Testament is big on the idea of the church. Just in these verses that we've heard read today, the idea of the church as a fellowship of people is front and center. The church is more than a building. It is more than a place. It's more than a program. It's more than the preacher. Thank God for that. It's, it's the people, right? All of the people of Christ. The scripture uses words like, Partners in the gospel, sharers of the work. Paul uses the expression, you all. Paul must have been from the south. <laughs> the way I feel about you all, how I long for you all together, together, together. It's an expression of fellowship, a family. The idea that we are all in this together, helping each other. Pulling together, not apart. A family of believers moving in one direction. The $5 expression is the priesthood of all believers. We support, we help, we encourage one another. Paul just comes right out up in front in this letter, right off the bat, says that his desire to, is to elevate the appreciation for the body of Christ. So it's a good passage to examine at the beginning of a new year, especially after another year of three in a row with COVID. And maybe our connection in the church might have sagged a little. Or maybe you have come into this church after the experience of being burned uh, or exhausted by some other church fellowship, or after 40 or 50 or 60 years of going to church and giving to the church and working in the church, its significance maybe has dulled for you a little. So let's come back to some basics about the church and maybe regain some uh, new perspective and new appreciation. It's no secret that I am a satisfied customer when it comes to the body of Christ. For 50 years, I have been involved in it up to my neck. And I'm not ashamed to confess that I think about it in the daytime, I dream about it at night, and have poured all of my creative energies into its mission and purpose. I admit 
that I am addicted. <laughs> There's another story about a, a family who was going home from church one Sunday and the, the dad was fussing about the sermon being too long and sort of boring. Mom said she thought the organist was playing too loudly during the second hymn. The daughter, who was a, a music major in college, said she thought the soloist sang about a half note off key. Grandma said she couldn't hear very well. And as they pulled into the driveway, little Willie nudged his dad and said, but dad, you got to admit, it was a pretty good show for a dollar. <laughs> what I notice about people who look at the church as a pretty good show for a dollar, spend a lot of time thinking about things uh, like what people wear or how people perform or how people talk. It's not the whole picture. The longer I live and the better I understand the big picture, the less I ever want to focus on those things. It's not really what the church is all about. And so for the next few minutes, I'd like, I'd like you to think about the church. What a marvelous gift God has given us in the body of Christ. Go back to the time when you first heard the hymns and you first listened to the sermons and formed your first impressions about the church. For many of us, it was the first days of our childhood, and those are pleasant memories. For others, perhaps they were not so pleasant. If I were in charge of the world, I would remove all of the hurt that the church has caused in some people. And maybe you have come to this church to find some healing, if that's the case, I want you to know that this is a place of acceptance and grace and welcome, whatever your experience has been, and it is our intention to love you. Maybe you grew up in this church. If that's the case, what a, what a wonderful blessing that is. Or maybe it was in some urban church or located in a big city, cars buzzing by outside, maybe a big tall building with stained glass windows. Or maybe you grew up in a suburban church, maybe within walking distance of uh, your home. Or near the beach, as it was for my wife. For many, it might have been a little country church located in a rural part of, uh, of the state where you live. Like the one William Pitts wrote of long ago. There's, uh, there's a church in the valley by the wildwood no lovelier place in the dale, no spot is so dear to my childhood as the little brown church in the vale. You remember that one, right? Well, that was my church, except that, <laughs> yeah, you started the chorus, didn't you? Yeah, uh, we know that, yeah. Uh, my church was a little, little church in the wildwood, except it was white, not brown. What a place. I cut my teeth on two-hour worship services that included three sermons and long prayers on our knees facing the back of the pew, the slowest singing you have ever heard. <laughs> Amazing grace. I'm not kidding. No wonder it was two hours. <laughs> but you know, faith is more caught than taught. And it was there that I first discovered that Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. When I caught that, it was profound. It was there that you first felt that there is something bigger than you that you, you are part of a, a long history of what God is doing in the world. You might have sung or played your first solo there or sang in your first choir, saw your first wedding and funeral and baptism. When grief came, the banker, the insurance person, or an attorney gave your family advice, but chances are that the person who spoke well of your loved one and reminded you of the faith that helped you to go on was the pastor. 
There were people that brought food and hope and hugs. It was there that you experienced a group of people who became a part of your life. You saw them every week, and they laughed with your family, and they wept with your family, and they celebrated with you. Just a little pocket of people. And because of them, seasons had new meaning. Easter, Thanksgiving, Christmas took on new color. Partners with you in the gospel. And I have the church to thank for all of those rich childhood memories. We want that for the children of our church. It's why we say what we say in our bulletin, that wiggles are welcome in worship. I credit Pastor Amanda for the work that she has done to bring in new families and all of her work with children and youth, and we can actually see the difference that it has made, and we should thank her for that. Maybe you were a part of a youth group in church. Would you like to go back and relive those days? Maybe, I don't know. For some, it was a time of crisis. Certainly a time when your bodies and your minds were becoming mature, thinking new thoughts. The world was becoming a bigger place, and you were finding your place in it. Maybe there was an adult who spent time with you and believed in you. A youth uh, teacher or a Sunday school teacher who expressed a love for God and a love for others, serving others in a way that sets you on a new path. Maybe it was a time when you began to think about the gospel in a way that led you to protest the prevailing culture. And maybe there were people in the church that supported you in that. I hope that's the case. Maybe you came to a place where you decided this is the way for me. This is the place for me. And you were baptized. I don't know what it is about this particular church that cranks out young people of the caliber that it does. Maybe it's the water. I don't know. All I know is that I have taken dozens of youth on service and mission trips. And, and the two that I took from this congregation were stellar and exemplary and unique, way above all others that I remember. One trip to Puerto Rico, we were without water and without electricity for days, no showers, had to wash our clothes by hand on the deck of the house, couldn't flush the toilet, rice and beans every day, hard work in the rain every morning, hot sun every afternoon. Each of them took turns cooking and cleaning and doing devotions without a single complaint. I never heard an on-edge word from any one of them. The adults, maybe, but not the youth. <laughs> Those trips are etched in my mind. I really trust that the future is in good hands when I look at the youth of this church. Well, our youth are doing good things, helping the needy, helping the hungry, helping their neighbors, continuing the work of Jesus. And the church, as we grow, in it there are other moments of celebration. Verse 9 says, And this I pray, that your love may abound more and more in the real knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ. Things that are excellent. Maybe you found your mate at church. Or for some of us, at a church college. That was pretty excellent. Lots of people were married in the church. Who gave you any counsel? If you got any, it was probably from the pastor. Who was there to dedicate your baby? Who said, we affirm your family, we stand with you all the way? I'm proud to say that in this church, family can mean many different things. Gay, straight, 
partners, foster, adoptive, chosen, unchosen, single, many. Whatever configuration, the church is here to offer a helping hand, encouragement, an anchor. We need that. When we go through the tough times as adults, the birth of a child, the loss of a job, starting something new, moving to a new place, going through the stress of separation or divorce, children growing up and moving on or moving out, an illness in the family, a challenge of aging and death when it comes. It is during all of those times when the church offers its gentle support. Just to know that it is here, has always been here, and will always be here. We need that kind of humane point of view to lift us up. The church has staying power. It is in the church, week after week, where we learn faithfulness, it is in the church that we first learned to give and to tithe. It was the first place that I gave out of whatever I had earned as a child, whether it was mowing lawns or delivering papers or a birthday gift of money. Ten cents out of every dollar, no matter what, went into a little leather purse. And we took that little leather purse to church every Sunday morning, and it went into the offering, period, no matter what. It is in the church, if anywhere, that accountability and discipleship is modeled, where we are reminded, shape up, get with it. At least it was for me. And thank God for that. I wouldn't be standing here if it weren't for people like Mrs. Herbster and Mrs. Buss and others in the church. It was in the church where we find roots that establish us for life. It is the church that speaks relevantly about the kind of world that we should be striving for, a world of peace and justice, a place of compassionate service, stewardship of creation, respect for diversity, a sanctity of human life, and where the vulnerable are protected and defended. Three cheers for the church. In spite of all of its weaknesses and human culpabilities, it is still the most significant rallying place for you on this earth today and will be for the rest of your life. You are the salt of the earth, said Jesus. That's your role. Seasoning, flavoring, preserving. The world expects it from us, even though it may not always agree with us. Three cheers for the body of Christ. It is the salt of the earth, a light on a hill, seed for the word. Bring forth the kingdom. Amen.